Chris is um, responsible for all the building information modeling to facilities management and operations internationally with Gary Technologies. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to hit you with a, with a number of things today. Um, not necessarily project specific, but there's a case study at the end. Um, it's a different level of scale than what you've seen thus far, but it incorporates everything, frankly, from the residential level all the way to the Frank Gehry uh, level of things. Um, <clears throat> I throw that caveat out there because we have, I've got Gehry in the name here. Um, just as a little bit of background, there's Gehry Partners, which you, you see and either you know and love or you don't know and love. Um, from an architectural point of view. And then there's the Gary Technologies part. And what happened in roughly 2002 was the Barcelona fish was being designed. And Frank Gary literally went from napkin sketch, which he does to this very day, uh, and wanted to go to fabrication, which he could not at the time. There was literally in 2002, there wasn't really a piece of software aimed at the AEC market that would take you from that level of design to that level of fabrication. And so in his form, he decided, we'll just do it. And so thus, Geary Technologies in-house became this thing. And it literally took Katia and Dassault and many other pieces of software and sort of mashed those uh, pieces together, not necessarily from the AEC industry, but from other industries, the best of, of some of those industries, brought them in-house and developed a technological team around that to support, frankly, some of the designs. Raise your hand if you've seen a Gary design since his youth that has a 90 degree angle. Okay, so you, can, you know that there's a, there's a particular level of beauty and there's a particular level of complication behind the beauty. And that's sort of where we are today with Gary Technologies. Um, I'm gonna jump through that. Uh, what I wanna talk to you about today, and I'll sprinkle a little bit of the, the Gary Partners versus the Gary Technologies in there. Is, is about BIM, obviously, but, but in the realm of the owner. What is the owner? What's the owner getting? What's the ROI for the owner? Why would the owner pay for or even ask from AEC uh, community to utilize BIM? From a contractor's point of view, you're going to run numbers and you're going to figure out whether it helps on a project or doesn't. From an architect, engineer, design consultant, you're going to run those same numbers and figure out whether the tool helps, the process helps, or it doesn't help. And a lot of that is based on fee. I would argue whether the fee is a dollar or a hundred million dollars, it helps. <clears throat> but that's me. And then I'll talk a little bit about cloud computing, and I know others um, uh, will talk a little bit about that too, but how it is essential for Gary Technologies to do what it does on a daily basis. And frankly, since roughly 2002, we've used some type of cloud computing from 2002 on. And I would add that this particular uh, piece that I'll talk about, um, comes from our AEC O world. It wasn't a piece of software designed and then tried to sell. It was, it came from the process. The process you heard from the residential side, from the commercial side and, and on. And then what does it mean FM? Facilities Maintenance Operations, BAS Systems, BMS Systems, CMMS Systems, all these acronyms that, that sort of drive the owner side. How do we utilize it? How do we implement it? And then I pulled out, you know, it's, it's Frank Gary, of course. I pulled out, you know, the biggest of the big project. And I throw that out as a caveat because I want you to know that everything you see here today we use on the smallest projects to the ones you actually get to read about. Um, and I'll talk about some of those small projects. So we think of BIM not necessarily as a, a, a rendering, although that's part of it, or even a group of objects. We think of it, especially from the owner side, as data, information. There's not a huge number of owners across the country, let alone across the world, and we work with them every day, that dig into the BIM model, like Josh does, or anybody else does from the AEC side. They use the BIM model as a view into information about how they own and operate long term. So the people that we deal with from the owner side, they aren't necessarily thinking about new construction, a 9, 18, 24 month, 36 month schedule, they're thinking about 40 years out. They're thinking about 50, 60 years out. And frankly, who's an owner in the audience? Okay, I, I won't bash owners too bad then. Um, frankly, the idea of what happens 40 years from now is not honestly as critical as what happens 40 hours from now or 40 days from now. Because there's always preventative maintenance schedules, there's always some kind of retrofit and renovation even on day one of new construction. 
So we think of it as a database. The information is always changing, even though the model may not change all the time. And we look at maintenance work orders, emergency services, continuous commissioning. Some of these are buzzwords, but we really try to make them meaningful to the owner. Energy optimization. Um, visualizing work orders is sort of like hyperlinking in a Navisworks model or a Celebri model. It's low-hanging fruit. It gives you lots of ROI for the owner. Facility condition assessment, life uh, safety inspections, and then life cycle lead sustainability analysis. We use everything in the book to try to get to the real sustainable and, frankly, lead calculations for a lot of our owners. So this was the big idea in 2008, 2009 when I was at uh, Texas Facilities Commission. Um, I, think, uh, <coughs> I think it was you, Tom, that said uh, it, it's, you didn't necessarily want to, uh, it's a tool and you didn't necessarily want it to necessarily be the silver uh, you know, lining, the, sil the silver bullet. I did. I wanted to eat the elephant at the state of Texas. I wanted it to not just be a tool, I wanted to push the button and I wanted all of the marketing that I'd heard work, period, out of the box. That was a pretty big hurdle. But at the state of Texas, what we looked at is our own system. We didn't look at necessarily the AEC market. We said, what are we doing uh, that is wrong? What are we doing that's bad from an own and operate standpoint? And then what are we getting from the AEC market on all this retrofit, renovation, new construction? You know, the state of Texas has, I think, currently $880 million biannual budget. 60, 70 percent of that is renovation retrofit. It's not new construction. So we weren't necessarily looking at, at the time, how do we affect new construction on all of our campuses? We were saying we own 24 million square feet of exi existing facilities. How can we use this on that information? So, we internally had a very small group um, who understood BIM to a certain extent, could model. We went, uh, John H. Reagan building and a number of other buildings, we modeled those to what we considered at the time level 500, or that as-built condition. It was more about data than it was about the objects in the, in the building. Um, I, on the John H. Reagan building, we went all the way back to, I think, 1929, hand-drawn, you know, mylars in the sun kind of thing to get some of that information. Um, that tells you how far back the state of Texas holds documents. <clears throat> um, but the idea was, how can we make this thing BIM a Rosetta Stone? How can we allow everybody across the state organization, not just TFC, not just design and construction, not just energy management, but everybody see the information that they need? Not everyone in administrative or space management cares about energy management but somebody might. There might be one piece of information that they could use. <clears throat> so we worked really hard to tie, and even going so far as to build our own uh, cloud-based server system, because at the time, 08, 09, you can imagine, we would get, if we got BIM models, we would get five, six, seven, eight, ten of them, right? And then we would have to be the, the geniuses to put them back together in some form or fashion for the state. <clears throat> so we decided that we would enter into, at the time, I wouldn't call it a cloud, but a server system that would basically allow the architects, engineers, and contractors that worked for us, TFC, to use that system put completely free of charge. It was total collaboration and, and trying to get everybody in on that. That since has become its own market, cloud, BIM, and, and that sort of thing. And I'll talk a little bit more about what it looks like now. So this was the big idea, connect everybody and everything. Why? Well, back in uh, about 2004, there was a large study that went across the country and looked at basically two major things. Interoperability, what does it cost us? And on top of that, what does it cost us as a country in the AEC OO market to be on paper versus digital? And what this found out, this was a, a 1.1 billion square feet. This attacked the architects general con and engineers, general contractors, fabricators, and owners, and tried to come up with and correlate and understand how much do we lose. So from a design uh, point of view, we lost about 63 per, uh, cents per square foot on interoperability, working in paper and PDFs and maybe a little CAD here and some other kind of CAD there and maybe a piece or two of BIM here. <clears throat> and then in construction, we lost even more, 79 cents per square foot. This is designing and building on paper and then we build it and then we tear it out and then we build it again and we tear out a little bit more because not of any bad person in the, the ointment here. It's because the process was built 
I do something, I hand it to you, you do something, you hand it to him, and so on and so forth. And there's a gap. There's a loss of information. And it always comes back. So what it found out basically, what it surmised was that first cost, you lose $1.65 per square foot. It doesn't matter what it is. It, this is commercial construction, not residential. But a billion square feet. That is a one-time cost per project. But annually, from then on, to the owner, they lost 23 cents a square foot per year because from an architect's point of view, engineer, contractor, we gave them substandard documentation to own and operate that building. And I would say substandard as a kick to all of us, but on top of that, they then used roughly bad information, some bad information, to make equally bad decisions over and over and over. If you crawl around some of our state of Texas buildings, you will notice that it's not exactly the most efficient above the ceiling. There are things that are critical issues and they get fixed right then. They don't necessarily get fixed in the context of the duct run servicing everybody else or the VAV box or the chiller. So that is sort of one band-aid on top of one another that, that equals this 23 cents a square foot. Um, what we're all talking about today can directly affect this $1.65 and can easily affect the 23 cents a square foot. So if you want to talk to your owners and your clients about direct uh, costs that you save them, that 23 cents a square foot long term, I don't, I don't honestly care if it's a residential customer or a commercial customer, that's, that I would, I'm gospel on this. I'd, I've seen this happen. So at the state of Texas, we went out and we said, okay, we're going to try to create a standardized set because we, we reviewed every document that came in to, to the state for new construction, ren uh, renovation, retrofit. And to be honest with you, every set from every architect and engineer was different. So it took us a long time to give you, the AEC market, good comments back in a, an efficient time. We didn't want to delay you. So we created a document standard, schedules, graphics, so this was all based in Revit. We, we required the RVT format and we required IFC format at the time. <clears throat> now what we do within Geary Technologies, this is a you know, four years uh, or five years leap here, <clears throat> is we work in a the similar process to what we've always done except that it is fully coordinated and by fully coordinated every architect every engineer every contractor every subcontractor every fabricator on our projects looks at the same piece of information all the time at the same time okay so and if they don't want to do that they probably aren't going to work on the project so there is an upfront kumbaya where we all get together and we say, yep, this is the process that we're going to work on. And these people, all these good AEC engineers and contractors and, and architects <coughs> that work with uh, either Gary partners or we work for on a project team, they're everywhere. They're not just in Austin and San Antonio and Dallas. They're in Kuala Lumpur. They're in Houston, Texas. They're in Sydney, Australia. <coughs> And we're all looking at the same thing at the same time. That's the power that we're talking about. And because of that, we can start to normalize the information going across there. Architect has a particular uh, vocabulary. Engineer has a particular vocabulary. Contractor definitely has a, a vocabulary, <coughs> especially the ones I've worked with in Texas. And we need to normalize that information across, make everything look and sound the same so we understand it, so we aren't losing data. And we can sort of what I call data commission continuously. Um, I'm going to jump through this. This is really sort of the process that we use internally. This is the cloud piece. Um, what I really want to talk about, though, is what the, the cloud piece that we use within GT, known now sort of publicly as G-Team, is what we call agnostic. I don't care if you're an architect who uses Revit, and I don't care if you're an architect who uses ARCHICAD, and I don't care if you're an architect who uses Bentley. Come on, let's do it. <clears throat> the cloud-based system that we have created, that really I had no part in, but was created, will pull in any, any 3D or 2D package and put it in a cloud form. And in some cases with the big elephants in the room, like the Revit's and the Archicad's and the Bentley's, there's no plug-in. You just upload to this cloud that we're all working in collaboratively. And if this was a Revit model on your laptop, it is 
all of the data and all of the objects pulled directly into the cloud, so all of us get to see it now. I can't edit it, okay? I can't break it, but I get to see it and I get to look at the metadata. Okay, think about that for a second. We talked about coordination and how it works on the AEC side. How does that help the owner now? I can give the owner a window, especially at close to substantial completion where commissioning is going on, a window into their own building. Now they can start to create preventative maintenance schedules. They can start to train their staff virtually on the mechanical spaces and the rooms in their building. Because please have no doubt, the models that, especially at GT that we are creating, are level 500 because we're going to fabrication. <coughs> um, we also use internally, and, and uh, this is basically the Kobe platform for normalization, for our government clients, we definitely use this. Um, I don't put Kobe up here only because tomorrow it may be slightly different. Just like any standard that we're going by today, it's always getting better, it's always getting more robust. It may honestly get a little bit more complicated because of that. But right now, this is what basically Kobe is. A lot of the times, if you work with a Kobe standard or a client that's asking for Kobe, um, and this is sort of a da data normalization that came out of Army Corps of Engineers, GSA, <clears throat> what you will find is that they're delivered an Uber, and I mean a very, very complicated looking spreadsheet. And if you hand that spreadsheet to your facility staff member, and you expect those, those staff members or the executive of the staff member or the president of the whatever, to open up that spreadsheet and try to find VAV box one, two, three, blah, 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 you're gonna have a problem, okay? The information's there. Don't, don't even, I, I, I'm, not, I'm just gonna say it's perfect and don't even doubt the information's there. Can you use it? How simple is it? Can, is it a one button push? What we've basically done is taken this structure and embed it into the model. So again, if I'm a facility staff member of this room, <clears throat> I probably know about this door. I probably know what's above the ceiling because I've been up there, right? If you show me a picture of this room, I can go, yep, that's light number six. If you show me a model of this room, I can say, yep, that's light number six. If you show me plan section elevation and a spreadsheet, it's gonna take me a minute to figure out where light number six is. That's the point. <clears throat> so there's le different levels of, of detail in what we're talking about. This is the level of detail that basically I'm talking about is 500 is, is as built. That's both object and data. We, we, we work with digital drawings as opposed to paper, and we fabricate from the model, not necessarily from uh, construction drawings. <clears throat> and so the model has to be live, it has to be real. Now when I came on board GT, we, we started talking about what's, what's the benefit of what we do from an AEC point of view to the owner, and I started looking at the models produced, and they said, can we do anything with these? for the Disneys of the world and the Sonys and so on and so forth. I was uh, shocked that that was the question <clears throat> because the models that they built from their process had probably 85% of the facilities information that they needed already. So adding to it wasn't that difficult. Um, so being able to go back to these clients, <clears throat> and by the way, architects, engineers, contractors, you have this information already. You collect this information either as a piece of paper or a PDF. If you put it into these models, now you have something more to sell, frankly. <clears throat> um, and, and basically, that we're doing the same thing with, with GT. A lot of the projects where you see BIM, you see um, Revit, ARCHICAD, Bentleys of the world sort of on, on staff, and you see the Navisworks models from the GC's point of view, the facilities deliverable, so to speak, is a Navisworks or maybe a Celebri model, something similar to that with hyperlinking out to something else. And that's fine, that's low hanging fruit. It's somewhat labor intensive, frankly, when you're the person having to, to make all of these connections, but it does work. It's relatively tried and true and we've, we've done it many times. There's other levels of this. <clears throat> um, Bi-directional links from information and in, let's say your, your uh, Maximos or your uh, Asset Works or whatever CMMS system you might have so that you can be the person looking at a spreadsheet, you're the spreadsheet person, or you're the uh, computer management system guy, or you're the uh, CAFM system person, and you don't know anything about BIM, doesn't matter. You push your button 
and the information from the model, just data, either appears because it's real time or it takes you to the model and shows you the thing you're looking at. It's no longer zeros and ones. It's no longer text or numbers. But it's the thing that's about to get a work order generated for it. That may not mean anything to the person at a keyboard. It means a lot to the person in the field who needs to typically go and find a manual somewhere or pick up an e-size sheet of documents and look through those. And those e-size sheet of documents, I'm going to assume were perfect day one. Day two and on, not so perfect. And it has nothing to do with the architects and engineers and contractors in the room. It has everything to do with we just knocked down that wall because we didn't need two offices. We needed a small conference room. And nothing got documented. <clears throat> so that's, that's process. And we, we deal a lot with process. This is really the technology that helps aid that process and, and make it somewhat similar. Technology is easy to consume, frankly. Process is a much, much bigger hurdle. At the uh, University of Texas, what we, we talked about, and this was not a GT project, but me personally, um, talked about basically on some of their student union projects is taking the BIM model, tying it to, in an as-built fashion, to just mechanical systems, and then barcoding those mechanical systems so that any staff member from the facility side could walk up in the field, barcode the object, okay? It, pull, it took you directly to the model and gave you the information historically about that object. So you very quickly erased the time it took you to pick up the manual or the contract documents or anything paper or PDF related, and now you, have, you start answering questions very quickly. Um, in a sort of metric version of that, what we found was for UT and uh, Texas A&M was that, I'm, I'm just generalizing here, but we sort of normalized the data. <coughs> Each work order over any period of time took about three hours. That was from the worst case scenario to the best case scenario, right? We saved almost immediately because we found that about 30% of that roughly was finding the information to go do the work. That was eliminated. The information was there, boom, at your fingertips. And then on top of that, because you could see what you were about to do in context, and it wasn't necessarily sitting on a piece of paper or a PDF, now I instinctively know, because I'm the guy who fixes it, right? I instinctively know it takes a ladder, two more guys, this piece of equipment, that sort of thing. So what we found, and I'm just saying roughly, I, I would conservatively say we saved another 5% on that work order, maybe 10 to 15. <clears throat> that's real dollar. That's real labor inefficiency. And, and I didn't fire anybody. I didn't lower you know, the number of people we use. I just made everything more efficient. When you're talking about University of Texas, you probably have 12, 24, 3,600 a year, probably more. When you're talking about a Parkland Hospital in Dallas, their current facilities, not the new construction, they have 7,000 work orders a month. What do you think the number one work order has to do with? Just, just anything. <clears throat> That's a really good one. I was shocked to find out that it's doors. It wasn't a mechanical piece, it was doors. Because if they had to replace every door that a gurney ran into and scratched and scuffed up, that starts to be a big number. But absolutely, lights were in there. So once you, once you give the owner the ability to find this data, what else can you do to it? Well, from an energy sp perspective, we can tie BIM models directly to objects. Not just through the Siemens and the Honeywells and the, the other uh, BMS and BAS systems. We can tie them directly to smart objects that have Wi-Fi and, and uh, Bluetooth and other things built into them. <clears throat> but if you don't have that, but you do have a Siemens or a Honeywell on board on your, on your projects, you can tie basically what's essentially a database, um, whether it's on a laptop and it has connectability to Siemens or Honeywell or whoever. Or even better, if it is in this cloud environment, now you can start making all kinds of connections. But now we can start to control the building. From a control systems point of view, that's one of those sort of ivory tower pieces that the control systems people don't necessarily want to give away. I understand that. But from a staffing point of view and maintenance, <clears throat> if I know which bulb is out, if I know almost exactly where that light is in a room on a campus the size of UT or, or A&M, that's some very, very helpful information. And it's sitting in Siemens. It's sitting in Honeywell. Okay, but can we get to it? That's the problem. Okay, so 
<coughs> in the end, what we're shooting for is all data is interconnected. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Here's the real image. Here's the virtual image. There's all the data connected to those two things. Um, and here's just a quick case study. Cleveland Clinic in, in Abu Dhabi, supposedly the largest hospital in the world right now. Um, this was obviously full BIM. The project team was literally all over the world. We're working in a cloud-based environment. We see all of the models down to, you know, the, the CAD ducts of the world, the miscellaneous steels of the world, the architects' versions. Um, and we're getting from, you know, macro to micro in this building for the owner. So obviously this is a hospital. Believe it or not, the equipment, the movable equipment, the equipment that can go missing is extremely important to the hospital staff and the maintenance and how they do maintenance and how they track assets. So being able to have that in a lot of the even residential architectural models, you see a lot of furniture. Some of our clients want to track furniture because they may have, frankly, multiple houses or they may have an art collection or something to that extent. Um, this is the level of detail we're getting to on, on mechanical pieces. Um, you're looking at pipe hangers and hangers and secondary duct support. That's, a lot of that is even miscellaneous steel, but that is as built. Um, you can see mock-up of spaces. We have information. You know, this is, this, the little call-outs here are real time. I've got an architect in, in uh, Sydney and someone on site uh, in Abu Dhabi, a project team on site. And then there may be someone who has, you know, they're, they're the specialized panel subcontractor and we're all making notes at the same time, similar to sort of the go-to idea. But it's not on somebody's computer. It's not in somebody's office. It's everywhere all the time. Um, and then we can obviously, this thing, whatever this BIM thing is, is saturated with information. So what if you can't get to it? So the whole point is, can you, from the AEC point of view, from the owner's point of view, dig into that information and get to it? The end. <clears throat> Thank you very much, I appreciate it. We're gonna to move to a, a panel discussion and invite uh, to join our three speakers, David LaRue with uh, Archi um, Solutions and Daryl Smith, the Medicat architect, and he is um, representing um, a whole BIM, uh, an ex, what was the word? <laughs> BIM, in all, all perspectives of BIM with Revit and all kinds of other, um, and misspelled something there. And they'll join us. And so here's their contacts. Please have some lively discussions, some interesting topics. Bring it up. I think they could sh uh, sh um, go back and forth. If for some reason you didn't write this down, you can contact me. I'm Shelly Murray with Austin Energy Green Building and Commercial Program. And you can look me up. But you all please come up and, and please start um, having some interesting dialogue. If you present. The, the working roadmap, and then you install, and it doesn't work. Sorry, you're going to get that call. And you know, I mean, none of us are lawyers, so you know, as far as contract language or whatnot, how you write that, you know, that's a question for your lawyer. Um, but what I always tell people is, you know, for an MEP system, as an example, to, to quantify the energy use of your building, I would have to know every single physical fixture in your building. I would have to know every person that's in your building, how long they're in there, what their breathing rate is, blah, 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 blah. And there's no way to quantify that and be exactly precise. It's not possible in today's technology. Now, there might be a day where we measure everything and we can quantify that. But the reality is you're using this as a design tool to give predictable results relative to another design option. So within any given BIM model, you're going to have a certain amount of garbage or lack of information that may not be included. As long as you're comparing the same lack of information between two different models, you can still make an intelligent decision as a comparison. You're looking at uh, comparative things. And so I, you know, how, how uh, Austin Energy comes up with a standard of how to measure that in a way that is objective and that's, it's tough. And, they, and you know, I, I don't even want to mention there, I'm not an engineer, so, but there, there's a lot of different factors that can play into it, and that's, you know it's coming down the road as technology gets better and as we get a better grasp on it as an industry, but right now the use is 
if you're trying to present to your owner two different options, I mean, the example I always use is if, if you're trying to debate whether to use one inch rigid insulation versus two inch, you can quantify the, the cost of installing that because you can calculate how much you have in your design. And then you can actually run an energy analysis both ways with two different R values in your walls and see what the difference is in percentage. And then you can make a rough guess on the energy cost based on the cost of energy in your area. And those are all, that's all possible. Um, is it going to be exact? Is that dollar savings going to be precise? No. But it's just a way to make an, a, an educated uh, decision as opposed to, you know, right now, what do you do? You say, well, two inch insulation will save you money down the road. And the conversation ends there. I mean, you don't have anything tangible to show them. Well, with the energy model, you have something real that you can. I mean, it's not absolute. I'm not saying that at all. And, and, you know, when you give it to them, you need to explain that to them. But, and that's the part, right? You need to explain it to them. This is, I'm not saying I'm going to save you X dollars. I'm saying this will be better than what you're doing. And this is roughly the return on investment you're looking for. I just want to add one other caveat to that is that, I don't want to drag this out too much longer, but the, another part of that is the owner's use of the building. And I think that's the biggest problem with true litigation when it comes to energy modeling is that we model in this environment where everything is perfect. And we assume that the client that's in the, I'm sorry, the climate data that's in the computer is not going to happen, you know, that year. You know, we don't have, we assume like on an average basis what the yearly climate of that, that building is going to be. Whereas last summer we had no rain, it was hot, you know, a lot of things change that and, and so educating the client and making them understand that the energy usage is not just as much about the energy model itself it's about how they use the building so many times do we turn over a building to an owner and they don't fully understand the systems or they don't understand why something works and this goes into some of the stuff that Chris is talking about you know and then they go and they change one setting and it completely changes the entire dynamics of how that energy is used in that building um, and the understanding of that so I think if you do get in a situation where it is a litigation it, it's gonna get interesting because it's gonna be who's how do you really prove who did what wrong? You know, was it was it designed improperly or was it used improperly whenever the owner moved in? And, and on that note, I don't, I don't know of any MEP lawsuit currently that is because the air was too cold or too hot or, or the cost was too high or low. I do know of litigation because the air conditioning system leaked. It's usually <coughs> because of a malfunction within the system. You know, you, you have condensate dripping on my my restaurant guest or something like that because it wasn't calculated correctly. Those happen and, and that's preventable through a lot of this uh, energy model. But I, I don't think, you, I've never heard of a, a lawsuit on you know the air too cold or, or the cost of my energy is too high. 